Come, let us go to the motherland, the happy land of England. Make you understand. Oh, yeah. I don't think that's in the New and Testament, then, what that uh, what that vicar told you. They were saying, no blacks, no orange, no, no dogs. No dogs. So they had to switch on central heating off, so we couldn't <laughs> use it anyway. So, so you sat there shivering some <laughs> yeah, floors, floors up. up yeah, with a chill factor. <laughs> a top-down approach so that working-class people were not involved in the whole process. Fifty years ago, England were busy winning the World Cup, Harold Wilson was busy being Prime Minister, and the Beatles were on what turned out to be their final tour. In the West Midlands, the people with the power were making decisions about how we lived, about immigration, housing, the economy and transport. These were decisions that would change the West Midlands forever. I'm Adrian Childs, born and bred in the West Midlands, actually born in March 67, which means I was conceived in 66, which isn't an image I care to dwell on, if you don't mind. So what was it like here half a century ago? Well, Football-wise, West Brom and Stoke were the top teams in the area. There's Astle, a great goal! Brilliantly headed by Jeff Astle. Excellent. In terms of industry, we were making cars like nobody's business, although there wasn't actually a motorway network yet to speak of. The M5 hadn't reached Birmingham, there were bits of the M6. There's no spaghetti junction. We've already said music, the Moody Blues from Brom, were doing very well. In terms of housing, it was all about high-rises springing up everywhere, Coventry, the Black Country, Birmingham. And the population was changing colour. Go, As coloureds moved into the four-roomed houses, white people found fault with their habits. They disliked their noise, smells, and above all, overcrowding. Race relations in Smethwick became increasingly uneasy as immigration increased. Black and Asian people were now joining us with a huge influx of newcomers to the West Midlands. In the 60s, people from the Commonwealth were admitted to the UK at a rate of around 75,000 a year. Unsurprisingly, there was friction. Nobody seems to have seen this coming. Precious little planning apparently went into managing the consequences of the influx. Too late, arguably, legislation was passed aimed at harmonising race relations. At Birmingham University in 1966, research into the social and economic impact of the new West Midlanders was already underway. Back in the 60s, the thinking was they would come here, work for a bit, go home. And what happened in reality is many were joined by their families, settled and became um, an, a really important part of who we are today. For immigrants, life was plainly no picnic. There was prejudice at work, at play and on the doorstep as they looked for lodgings. On the ground floor here live Mr and Mrs Stephen Butler from the West Indies with six of their ten children. Mrs Butler expects her eleventh child in April. Landlords were very negative towards migrants, so many of the migrants ended up in the most deprived areas, in very run-down accommodation. Despite the spending of £66 million on council housing in the last ten years, there are still crowded acres of crumbling, creeping slums which challenge a city's conscience. 80% of the Birmingham population said that they wouldn't let a room to a migrant. Uh, they were really worried that migrants would be dirty, um, bring cultural practices that they found scary. Of course, that wasn't the, the case at all. Race relations became a key political issue. In a by-election in Smethwick, stuff went on which today would get you arrested. Posters like these appeared, supporting the Conservative Party candidate, Peter Griffiths. If people feel so strongly that they are prepared to put things in these words, we should not merely condemn them, because that will get us nowhere. We should find out what is it that makes them feel so strongly, and we should remove the causes. 
politicians tried to encourage integration with legislation. But by 1966, the 1965 Race Relations Act, which outlawed discrimination on the grounds of colour and race, was already being revised. Prejudice remained commonplace. 50 years later, things have changed, mostly. Back in the 60s, in Sparkbrook, racism would have been an everyday experience for migrants. Now, actually, people feel they fit in. They're quite convivial areas. But if you move outside those very diverse areas, people are still likely to experience racism. And that tends to make people want to remain in the more um, super diverse parts of the city. In Professor Fillimore's view, Birmingham has overcome many of its 1966 challenges. I think one of the things that's good about Birmingham is that as a city, we do embrace the fact that, that we're a super diverse city. It's become increasingly difficult with the lack of resources and the anti-migrant rhetoric, but we do enjoy that side of things. We try and celebrate it. So that's an academic's view of the immigrant experience in the 60s, but what was it like to actually live it? We've brought four people who came to the West Midlands in 1966 together to watch a film at the Electric Cinema in Birmingham. The oldest cinema in England just narrowly escaped being pulled down, by the way. This film was made in the mid-60s to coincide with the new Race Relations Act. There's some shocking stuff in it. But today, the insular guts of the street communities are rotting away. Slum clearance has upset the generations, and to add to the feeling of insecurity, there has arrived an army of total strangers, immigrants. Though white citizens of Smethwick didn't mind the immigrants working in their old and dirty factories, few wanted to know about them socially. As coloureds moved into the four-roomed houses, white people found fault with their habits. They disliked their noise, smells, and above all, overcrowding. Well, I don't mind them living in Smethwick, as long as they treat their houses the same as the white people are supposed to treat theirs. They're content with um, kitty cat and dog food instead of ordinary meat. The key to the tension is less colour than the immigrants' exotic habits symbolised ludicrously by their consumption at times of cat food. They're a nuisance when you've got to walk past them in the streets, they won't move. They're a nuisance at work, they won't work. Well, I think it's pretty awful. Uh, I think they should live uh, in a district all to themselves because I've got to bring this little boy up and um, they're not clean. <laughs> Children will often chant slogans which they must have picked up from somewhere, but nigger go home, usually applied indiscriminately to either Asian or Africa. Is it right, say Smithwickians, to ask us to live beside strangers and just leave it at that? Let me ask you this, what could have been done differently in 1966, I mean, or in the, in the 60s? The working class person had no idea what was about to hit them. Hmm. And it does raise the question, why? We had the cinema, we had the TV, we had radios. Why was this information not put forward? We're inviting the nignogs over because we need them. Factories are, be, are empty, you know? Yeah. Our boys didn't come back from the war. People weren't prepared and they, they, they came here and didn't have all the things that they thought they'd have. So the immigrants were, were kind of misinformed and ill-prepared and the us natives, if you can call it, were, were just as unprepared yeah. for the immigrants. Yeah. So with a bit more planning, things might have been different. Have yeah. We were told England is the mother country. Yep. We used to say, come, let us go to the motherland, the happy land of England. That was the song we used to sing. So when somebody said, oh, we, you, you, your mum is in England, you have to go and join her. We think we're going to the motherland, England. It's like brainwashing or something. You know, yeah. it's, it's like a... Bra total brainwashing yeah. right from yeah. primary we school was, onwards. We was didn't it? know yes. any other, other um, language but English. The bit, the bit I found most upsetting, actually, was when the guy went in for a haircut. Now listen carefully to this Indian's conversation with a white barber when he entered a saloon with a BBC radio microphone in his pocket. No. No sweater. No. Long clothes, man. And that, to me, got to the heart of it. It's like the banality of evil, almost, yeah. that he just yeah. wouldn't cut his hair. It's yeah. insane. 
Put it in for the clothes on outside and the window to jail. If you give me any reason why, what's with the matter, then I shall go if you to tell me. You're not close. You're not close. You're not close yet. A lot of what they were saying are still being said now. It's um, more covered. I've been going around trying to use a contactless ca um, card for the last month. And hey, they're not saying um, we're not going to accept it because you're black, but they're giving me conversations about fraud and you would like to know that somebody stole your card and tried to use it or the machine doesn't work. And yet it worked for the person before me and the person after. The smell of the cooking makes you feel sick. You get the smell of the cooking upstairs in the bedrooms. My dad said when they first came to this country and they couldn't get the, 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 the black food, say, mm -hmm. they said, you have to eat what the white people eat. Exactly. You have to integrate with them, otherwise go back home. Around this time, famously, a Wolverhampton MP by the name of Enoch Powell was getting complaints from residents that their neighbourhoods were becoming more brown and black than white. Overcrowding was an issue, as multiple families of immigrants tended to live in numbers under one roof. But black and Asian people seldom had any choice but to live like this. A little while ago, two houses uh, were occupied by a family each. Now they've been sold. The one is one of the better sort. The other, uh, we don't know how many there are in. Where I only know there are hordes of children, and I understand there are five milk bills. We don't know how many more to the house. Three lines of washing are out day and night. My dad said when he came here first and he was looking for places, they were saying no blacks, no Irish, no, no dogs. No dogs. Yeah. You know? As a child, um, I lived in a house with many um, black people. There were lots of different families. So it, it, you can say it was a race issue because we wasn't able to go anywhere else to buy a house. I phoned to a lady. She said, are you a colored people? I said, not um, inside, from outside, outlook, I'm a colored people, you know. She said, I'm sorry, I'm not prepared. I told her, look here, lady, have you any previous experience from a colored uh, person who gave any sort of uh, trouble to you? Did you get the room? No, not at all, entirely not. I could not go there to have a look even. His town was a very poor, it was being slum clearance, high rise, high density houses. Slowly but surely from the mid 80s onwards, by the mid 90s, it had all gone brown because the whites moved out. You'd hope the churches would have opened their arms to immigrants. I'm sure some did, many didn't. Church leaders had hesitated to take sides over race matters for fear of losing their white flocks. When a large number of people with different coloured skins from far away came into the area, it's not surprising that uh, some of them reacted very strongly because there were reasonable grounds. When the coloured people came, they came in large numbers very quickly. And we'd get all dressed up and dress up the kids and everything, go to church, and we'd be greeted, um, you know, hello, nice to see you, you're looking beautiful, whatever. Can you not come back until next month? Um, because we don't want to upset the congregation. So we, we don't mind you coming, but don't come every week. Right. And so people started having church in their own homes. And from their own homes, they started hiring like yeah. school halls and things, or even the same churches they hired after the others had finished their service. No, I don't think that's in the New and Testament, then, what that, uh, what that yes, vicar told yeah. you. It seems very much generally as if nobody knew anything. Nobody prepared the immigrants for life in the West Midlands, and no one prepared West Midlanders for the coming of the immigrants. And everyone soon realised that these temporary guest workers wouldn't be leaving anytime soon. So far in Britain, few things can have been so ill-prepared as immigration. 
after hundreds of thousands of immigrants had arrived in a country, encountered all sorts of racism and, unwittingly, made worse an already big problem, a shortage of decent housing, a problem that needed addressing. In 1966, it wasn't just how we looked that was changing, it was also where we lived and what kind of buildings we were living in. In a month or two, these houses will be gone, and in their place will go a block of flats. They aren't particularly beautiful, but at least they have central heating and lifts. They're comfortable and up-to-date. In other words, they're properly designed for living in. High-rise flats were replacing back-to-backs like these in Birmingham. They're so rare now, they're museum pieces, literally. It seemed that everyone was being rehoused. Back-to-back -back places like this were being demolished in their thousands. In their place rose towers of high-rise flats. Brendan's a black country poet, raised in Tipton. He was four when his family was moved to a high-rise there. So seven floors up, no garden, just a six-foot balcony. But first of all, just suddenly being seven floors up. I mean, no kid is ever seven floors up, you know, <laughs> at that time. You know, no. there's no fairgrounds or, you know, there's no roller coasters to go on everything. It must no. have been amazing to have a view. The, the sunsets were incredible, but um, it was very difficult. The, the lifts often weren't serviceable, yeah. and it was so difficult to actually get down into the communal areas. Yeah. The central heating was so dry, it gave me chest infections right. and I, I could no longer sort of breathe properly. It's like a bronchitis or a croup I, I developed yeah. as a kid. And so they had to switch all the central heating off, so we couldn't <laughs> use it anyway. So, so you sat there shivering seven <laughs> yeah, floors, seven floors up. up. Yeah, with a chill factor, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I presume you're an active little four, five-year-old. So you could run around in a yard when you're in a terrace, but yeah. not when you're in a flat. My dad bought me a bike and, and, of course, you know, most kids can get outside into the yard to learn to ride a bike. I couldn't. So, um, yeah, I learned to ride my bike with a three-quarter bed one side and a fitted carpet the other to break my fall. So I suppose it was a soft option, <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. in that sense. But I know social problems arose from these kind of places, but you're making it sound like some kind of nirvana. I mean, you've got, you've got a nice warm place, you've got carpets, fitted bathroom, yeah. electric kitchen, sunset over the, the yeah. black country. Yeah. I mean, what's not to love? As years progressed, the council, and we know that it was a council move, decided to try and put some of the bad payers or the the, the less uh, socially aware people, shall we say, into the tower blocks. You can say low lives. I think people generally understand. <laughs> that. I'm trying not to. Okay. <laughs> we all know what you mean. It's fine. <laughs> and unfortunately, the trend was to bring the whole place down, and then we ended up with um, violence, uh, vandalism. Uh, and to a point where police and fire crews were actually stationed at the tower blocks because it was so bad. It's amazing, it just seems such a waste to put these buildings up yeah. and then pull them down again, all in sort of our lifetime. Well, just... yeah, I mean, within 40 years, I think it was, something like that. Yeah. Plans for new housing, new factories, roads, drains, shopping centres and 101 other things. The planning started 21 years ago. It's still going on today. Professor Carl Chin says that while high rises seem like economic common sense, no thought went into the social ramifications. After the Second World War, everybody's looking ahead. Where's the country of the future? America. People don't want to look backwards. And what have they got in America? Wide freeways for cars and buildings that tower up into the sky. They're also affected, these planners by Le Corbusier, the French guy who believes in cities in the sky. And so we see governments encouraging councils not to build on the ground, but to go up and up and up. I gave you my heart right from the start, yeah. The problem with going up high rise, when people first moved in, it's a great agent. My, they moved my nan from a back to back to a masonette. Not a high rise, but a masonette. She had electric lighting, hot water, an indoor bath, tremendous facilities. But soon people started to realise, where are my neighbours? So what was destroyed were neighbourhoods that had taken generations to build up. It's interesting, what I'm getting from it is that we were in too much of a hurry because you can build the best 
place in the world, but you, you can't build a community straight away. You might do it bit by bit and it will evolve and the community will move with it. And neighbourhood building, community building, it should be organic. Yes, councils and officials can provide certain facilities, but basically it's about people on the ground making their own communities. They were in a hurry, and in many respects you can understand that hurry. After the Second World War, by 1953, Birmingham had got 10,000 properties destroyed in the war. There was another 30,000 properties that needed to have been built to, to make up for the time that no building had taken place during the war. There was 30 odd thousand insanitary back-to-backs. You can understand the need, not just in Birmingham, but across the whole of the Midlands to rush forward, but perhaps they went a little bit too fast. You wrote me a letter. What was the effect of that? Because you can kind of see the logic. It's not a completely barking mad idea in the first place. So it, it's what went wrong? It's not a bad idea if people have been consulted. But as usual, it was a top-down approach so that working class people were not involved in the whole process of clearance of houses and redevelopment. And when councils designated a redevelopment area, they destroyed everything within it, even good quality buildings. So what was destroyed were neighbourhoods that had taken generations to build up. I'm staggered looking a little bit at the history and you've spent your lifetime looking at it. It's just how much waste there's been in terms of great building projects, putting stuff up and then tearing them down, sometimes within a generation, you well, know, let alone my lifetime. Sadly, that's the recurring theme in, in my own city, our own city. The Boring Centre opened in 1964 with fantastic hopes. Cast your mind back ten years to the girl who's next to me in school. Praise as the most advanced shopping centre in the world. A million square feet with office space, a third of that was retail space. Tomorrow won't be long, we're gonna have to play it cool. And then what do we have to do to it at the end of the 20th century? Right. Knock it down. Yeah. <laughs> it's mad, isn't it? Yeah. We learnt lessons from the last 50 years we, we're going to apply to the next 50 years or just make different mistakes. As a historian, sadly, I think we're going to make different mistakes and not learn the, the lessons. They can't be exact lessons, Adrian, because the context of time and place changes, but we should be learning lessons. And it's about consultation and empowering people in their own neighbourhoods. That's the key lesson. In 1966, the region still felt itself to be the kind of workshop of the world. The 60s generally were called the machine age and Coventry was right at the centre of it. A hundred years ago, someone invented the bicycle. Coventry was quick to take up the idea. The engineers of Coventry began to design improvements. Then someone had the idea of putting a motor on the bicycle. It worked too, so why not a four-wheeled cycle with an engine in the middle? The motor car was born, and Coventry was ready with the right tools and skills to make it. The economy was in a strong state. We were manufacturing right across the West Midlands. We had the potteries, the textile industry, we had clocks, cars, iron, steel, glass. These are the people who make Coventry what it is. In 1966, there was a drive to modernise for fear of falling behind the likes of Germany, Japan and France. Since the war, Coventry had become the very centre of the motor industry. All must have seemed well. Then, pardon the obvious metaphor, but soon after 1966, everything started to go down the toilet, factory closures, industrial strife, whole industries failing. Academics say Coventry, like the rest of the West Midlands, had relied on too few industries to sustain its prosperity. Firms focused on short-term profits at the expense of long-term investment. The region soon began lagging behind its competitors. The times in which we live have been called the machine age, and these are the people who make the machines. A programme all of its own would be needed to consider what went wrong in 66 when it came to the economy. But by the 21st century, thousands of jobs had gone from manufacturing into the service sector. Now it's more about hotels, convention centres, ever bigger shopping malls. We've got a service economy, not a manufacturing economy. How things have changed. Back in the 60s, just over there, they were building the new New Street, the new gleaming ball ring. 
only to then knock it all down and rebuild it. And then there's the roads. Ring roads were introduced to us in the 60s to accommodate the ever-growing number of cars. Motorways were seen as the only way forward. Train lines were being ripped up, trams became a thing of the past, although they're now making a comeback. The mighty car was taking over, and why not? Cars were made here after all, so why shouldn't everyone in Birmingham have one? We were actually going to be at the centre of a motorway box network eventually, with of course the M6 and the M5 and then the M42. So clearly some access to the motorway network had to be built in and out of the city. Inspired by American highway building, the motorways would get us from city to city. And the West Midlands would be a winner with Spaghetti Junction, the intersection all roads, perhaps too many roads, led to. I think where the mistake was made was actually building the tunnels when we did, and maybe actually mixing up the through traffic with the, the traffic which was actually destined for had an origin or destination within the city itself. And that's what's led to an awful lot of congestion. In 66, the big decisions about transport were all about the car. Very little thought seems to have gone into planning public transport. Most people went to work by car. There wasn't a policy of actually trying actively to discourage it. There is now, but of course with a lot of the pedestrianisation of places like New Street and Corporation Street, but that could have happened much sooner, I think. And rec Manchester recognised the, the problems which were developing much earlier. Interestingly, even then, planners saw a need for another main railway line from or to the south. It wasn't called HS2, but they were talking about it. Obviously, it remains a divisive issue. Many, here and elsewhere, are dead against the idea. Dr Hanlon, though, is very much in favour. The HS2 proposal could actually have a, a very dramatic effect upon all of the problems in Birmingham because it would present a lot of opportunities to actually get over a very difficult problem with the congestion on the rail in New Street Station. There's an acute lack of track capacity and also capacity for additional platform space. And it's very difficult to envisage any solution to that that doesn't involve actually the redevelopment of the old Curzon Street railway station, which will come if the HS2 proposal comes about. Well, they said that in 66, and we're still waiting. So it turns out that in the half century since 1966, we've been as keen as mustard to change the West Midlands and then change it all over again. Who knows what's going to happen in the next 50 years? I don't know whether we'll have won the World Cup again in that time, but I do know we will have put more buildings up in the West Midlands only to tear them down again. Are we going to have pulled Grand Central down? Is HS2 even going to have got started? Who knows? Join me again in 2066. And I love to live so pleasantly Live this life of luxury Blazing on a sunny afternoon Next month, the BBC is staging a special event to recreate England's World Cup victory at Wembley 50 years to the day. Tune in to your BBC local radio station tomorrow to find out how you could be there. I don't think that's in the New and Testament, then, what that, uh, what that vicar told you. They were saying, no blacks, no orange, no, no dogs. No dogs. Yeah. I had to switch on central heating off so we couldn't <laughs> use it anyway. So, so you sat there shivering some <laughs> yeah, floors, floors up. up yeah, with a chill factor. A top down approach so that working class people were not involved in the whole process.
50 years ago, England were busy winning the World Cup. Bits of the M6, there's no spaghetti junction. We've already said... Music, the Moody Blues from Brom, were doing very well. In terms of housing, it was all about high-rises springing up everywhere. Coventry, the Black Country, Birmingham. And the population was changing colour. As coloureds moved into the four-roomed houses, white people found fault with their habits. They disliked their noise, smells, and above all, overcrowding. Race relations in Smethwick became increasingly uneasy as immigration increased. Black and Asian people were now joining us with a huge influx of newcomers to the West Midlands. In the 60s, people from the Commonwealth were admitted to the UK at a rate of around 75,000 a year. Unsurprisingly, there was friction. Nobody seemed to... Harold Wilson was busy being Prime Minister and the Beatles were on what turned out to be their final tour. In the West Midlands, the people with the power were making decisions about how we lived, about immigration, housing, the economy and transport. These were decisions that would change the West Midlands forever. I'm Adrian Childs, born and bred in the West Midlands, actually born in March 67, which means I was conceived in 66, which isn't an image I care to dwell on, if you don't mind. So what was it like here half a century ago? Well, football-wise, West Brom and Stoke were the top teams in the area. There's Astle, a great goal! Brilliantly headed by Jeff Astle. Excellent. In terms of industry, we were making cars like nobody's business, although there wasn't actually a motorway network yet to speak of. The M5 hadn't reached Birmingham. There was... You've seen this coming. Precious little planning apparently went into managing the consequences of the influx. Too late, arguably, legislation was passed aimed at harmonising race relations. At Birmingham University in 1966, research into the social and economic impact of the new West Midlanders was already underway. Back in the 60s, the thinking was they would come here, work for a bit, go home. And what happened in reality is many were joined by their families, settled and became um, an, a really important part of who we are today. For immigrants, life was plainly no picnic. There was prejudice at work, at play, and on the doorstep as they look for lodgings. On the ground floor here live Mr and Mrs Stephen Butler from the West Indies with six of their ten children. Mrs Butler expects her 11th child in April. Landlords were very negative towards migrants, so many of the migrants ended up in the most deprived areas, in very run-down accommodation. Despite the spending of £66 million on council housing in the last 10 years, there are still crowded acres of crumbling, creeping slums which challenge a city's conscience. 80% of the Birmingham population said that they wouldn't let a room to a migrant. Uh, they were really worried that migrants would be dirty, um, bring cultural practices that they found scary. Of course, that wasn't the, the case at all. <laughs> Race relations became a key political issue. In a by-election in Smethwick, stuff went on which today would get you arrested. Posters like these appeared, supporting the Conservative Party candidate, Peter Griffiths. If people feel so strongly that they are prepared to put things in these words, we should not merely condemn them, because that will get us nowhere. We should find out what